Hey there, welcome to Have You Asked Your Dad. This is the podcast where we ask dads questions that they don't normally get asked. And today is the third and final episode in our series of how we met our kids. In episode one, I chatted to Sean about his experience of Zoe arriving in the world and how that was a tumultuous period of his life. In episode two, we spoke about the adoption process that led to Liam becoming part of our family and how emotional and tumultuous that was. And today we're talking about myself and Eli and how it was an emotional and tumultuous time when I met Eli for the first time. And I must say, in today's episode, we spend quite a bit of time talking about the real nitty gritty about the modern dad's experience of going through a pregnancy, uh, going through a birth and going through the first few days as a new dad. So if you have a new dad in your life, this is probably the episode for you to listen to and for him to listen to as well. So let's get right into it. Here's a conversation with me and Sean. General Lutz, how are you today, sir? Uh, generally well, I think. Thank you <laughs> nice. very much. Good job. Yeah. Um, how are you doing, Uncle T? What's news? Yeah, I'm all good. Nothing much. Just my cat in the background having a proper, proper lie on the chair that I would love to be sitting in right now, but I can't. Listen, I wanted to say on the previous episode, we started by calling me First Lieutenant. Um, yes. And I want to tell you that that's a rank that you achieve after 18 to 24 months of service, which isn't all that oh. long, I don't think. Yeah. That's not very impressive at all. No, you need to up your game, please. Oh, that's, that's Unless not even... I'm not that impressive, which isn't, you know. No, 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 no. I mean, I, look, I started with general lords for this one. So that's a serious jump up, right? That's okay, 10 years of right. service, well, surely. Yeah, you well, <laughs> let's just double check that now that I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming that general, uh, isn't general the highest rank in the military? Listen, it's been so much fun talking about how our children started their lives and how our lives changed so much with the, with the addition of kids. Yes, Um, we had Zoe, Zoe, it was the first, the first edition. um, And then we spoke about which, which kid yesterday, uh, last week? Um, uh, Liam. Liam, right. That one. (laughs) Wow. Have you got that many you can't remember? (laughs) Yeah, two. More than, anything more than one is uh, a lot. So. <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, yeah, and what a cool story about Liam as well. So I'm very glad we got to to chat about that. And I'm sure I'm going to have more questions about um, Liam being uh, the addition into your family. Um, and I, I'd, I'd be very interested to know if anybody else has sent you messages and asked more questions about that, or if that's the first time they'd ever heard you speak about the adoption process. And I think lots of people would have learned things from that previous episode. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I, 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 do, I do talk about the, the adoption stuff a lot. So if, if they followed me on Aphrodite for any length of time, at some point they would have heard similar parts of that story. So. <laughs> now, Eli, however, is your first biological child, although he's your second child. Correct. Correct. First and okay. only biological child. Uh, All right. Because he traumatized us so much, we'll never do it again. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> that's, that's not fair. I, 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 joke, I joke in ways about my kids that sometimes um, I realize make other people uncomfortable, but I, I'm assuming my kids <laughs> understand that it's in love. <laughs> I mean... Well, the one's biological, so he'd understand your humor through and through. The other one has figured it out by now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Liam, you they, know. In fact, they're both they're both pretty. Um, at least they try to be funny. They've recently discovered puns, so oh. they're, they're, yeah, yeah. So you know, they'll they'll be saying something like, uh, I can't even remember, but they'll they'll just take a word and break it ac- uh, break it apart, and then they'll say the word again, and then that's the joke. But they're getting there. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make for the best comedy in the world, but you know, they're eight and nine. So those are the fundamentals of comedy, the fundamentals. Ah, What? (laughs) That's exactly, that is exactly the kind of joke that was a hundred percent. You got it perfectly. That is an I'm Eli the coolest joke. uncle or what? <laughs> I know. I fit right in there. I fit in right in there. Now, can can we talk about what you recall with regards to Eli joining your family? First off, such a cool name. Not to say that Liam isn't, but Eli is such a cool name for me. How long did it take for you to decide on that? Uh, almost almost immediately. Uh, Julie really? had a bunch of names that she liked. And um, so his, his full name is... Um, uh, Eli Jack mentor. So Jack is yeah. Julie's dad's name. Um, I didn't say last week, uh, Liam is named after my, my, my father. My father's name is William. Okay. 
and so Liam from William. Uh, so to continue that tradition of having the mm. grandfather's name somewhere in the kid's name, uh, it's Eli Jack Mentor. And um, I think when she when she suggested it, immediately I was like, perfect. Great, great mm. name. I liked it too. I mm. thought it was strong. Okay, so Eli was one of the first names mentioned and it was easy decision in terms of what to name him, which means you knew it was a boy relatively early on in the process or maybe you didn't. What What was that like for you? I mean, we spoke last week about how Liam um, was around and then it wasn't long after Liam joined the family that you found out that Eli was on the way. Was that in any way planned, uncle? Parents. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and and Eli will know this uh, as he grows up that Eli wasn't Eli was the unplanned gift. Um, uh, I don't I don't think anyone would plan to have a child when they have a nine month old in the house as it is. Like you don't want to fall pregnant around that time. Um, but uh, yeah, so that wasn't planned at all. It was quite a shock. In fact, we we distinctly remember the day we discovered that Eli was a concept <laughs> and okay. it was 16th of December, um, on that public holiday. And, uh, we discovered that this was a, this was a thing. This, this is happening. Yeah, right. So, yeah. uh, so there was a, a lot of anxiety and freaking out and also a lot of laughter because this is the kind of thing that would, it would happen to us. That's the kind of story that yeah. we have. Um, so <laughs> it's a little bit like, oh, of course, yeah, there would be us. Um, and, and that anxiety of like, oh my word, this is, it wasn't really anxiety about having a second kid. It was just, whoa, this is huge. Just the bigness sure. of a child arriving of a pregnancy sure. was, was, it was a lot. It was a lot to take in. Yeah. I mean, if you think of, as a as a person on the outside, if I think about it, I've gone, well, you've only just gotten used to having the first one around full time. Now you're suddenly adding a second one. It's overwhelming for anybody, really. Um, yeah. And so often people talk about, well, you can't fall pregnant within those first nine months after having the first child. It's just not, it is not possible. Um, but it is. I've, I've had friends that have done exactly that. Yep. And they too have been in that same sort of space where they have freaked out a little bit. How are they going to cope? But slowly but surely you simmer down to a, okay, um, we can come up with processes and systems and so forth, and we will, we will get through this. Um, what's really interesting for me is the sense, and I said it previously as well, because you've adopted a child and now your second child is your first biological child. They're brand new experiences that you're going into having been a dad already for nearly nine months. So they're, they're new firsts that, that, that crop up like for argument's sake, finding out that you're pregnant, that, yes. that, that it was ceremonial in our house <laughs> when I found out that Zoe was born, um, to the extent that my wife had gone ahead and purchased socks that matched a pair of socks that I had. Oh, cute. When was, and was waiting for the day that she knew she was pregnant so she could gift me with socks because that's how she wanted to tell me. Um, <laughs> so it was very ceremonial. Uh, I, and, I, and what was the experience like for you? Where, where were you at when you found this out? We, well, we were, we were at our flat. It was, I distinctly remember it was a lovely like December morning and I just hear a, a panicked Terrence coming from the oh. bathroom. And yes. um, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm thinking that my wife's seen a rat or something yep, like it was spider. just a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a spider and um and she shows me the test and and then she says um she thinks that the test that she used was an expired test actually the test was expired okay. so so we can't really trust these results so we tr we're both trying to find all the reasons why this isn't actually happening at this time and and so and so we're like okay okay fine so we need to get a, a, a test that um that isn't expired i look on the box and i realize that she's she's switched the dates around the month okay. and the, the the month and the year so she thought that it was expired, but actually it was expiring the following year. Okay. So it was a totally valid test. Um, and so then we had another freak out moment. Um, <laughs> then we immediately went to get a, a proper blood test to see um, if it was, because we weren't, the, the, the test wasn't like super clear. And then the blood test came back like immediately like, yeah, yeah, you are so very yeah. pregnant. You are so, <laughs> yes. so a hundred percent. It's not a, it's a shadow of a doubt. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, that was a whole day of, um, of, of that happening. 
Um, Julie had to go. Julie had planned to go spend time with her grandmother, who she's very close to, but obviously can't really talk about it at that point. And all she wants to do is talk to her grandmother about it on the day, and she can't because it's still us processing it together. Um, uh, you know, finding ways to like, okay, now realizing. You know, she maybe can't be as physical with Liam as she maybe was before. I'm freaking out about that. I'm just seeing my cat stretch in the background there. Um, yeah. And and really, and and Liam at that point was was a big kid. He was a big, strong boy, who who needed a lot of physical interaction. So there was just so many things to try and figure out how to do. Think even something as simple as, you know, we're pushing Liam in a pram, and suddenly realizing we're going to need a double a double pram. We because mm. by the time baby arrives liam's not going to be out of the pram so we're gonna how's that gonna work where do you get to where do you get a double do double prams even exist um so <laughs> a lot of logistics and like uh, uh, there was just um but but also excitement there was a little there was a there was a level of um levity to that day at least now with me thinking back there wasn't um fear there was mm. excitement there was energy there was uh, like yes, let's do this. Um, even though it yep. wasn't planned, there wasn't a pair of socks waiting for me on on my pillow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I remember about that day. I listening back to you, and I can share in in some of that same feeling. I was going to ask you, did you have a sort of like a jittery feeling for most of that day? I, I remember there being a, a like a heightened sense of energy, and every time our eyes would catch, we'd be like. Oh my God, is this actually yeah. happening? And in some way feel like a naughty school kid, but yes. at the same time being very aware of how serious <laughs> the implications yes. of this and, are. And mature this thing is. And mature, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it kind so of feels like you're, sent... like you're over-caffeinated, like just the whole yes. day. You're yes. just, you've yeah. had way too many Red Bulls and you don't know if you want to sit down or stand up or go for a walk or mindlessly watch TV. Like there's no what do you do on that day because again it's not like you can call a bunch of people well i mean i suppose no. you could but we didn't want to do that so no you you're kind of just you're stuck in this like flat and there's the person that you want to talk that you can't talk to about it already knows all about it so you what are you gonna <laughs> what are you gonna say to them you can't say anything like yeah. it's like oh by the way we're pregnant and they're like yeah i know i told i was one who told you <laughs> i was there remember yeah I remember. a little while ago squeaky yeah. voice yeah, yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, so it's good memories from from uh, way back when now because yeah. Eli's just recently turned. Well, he's eight, turning eight. eight. He's turning eight in turning July. Turning eight. Yeah, no, it was Liam's birthday in January. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. What what great memories we do have of those those first moments of learning that we're going to be dads. Um, and then tell me, Terence. So your experience of being a I suppose what's the what's the best way to phrase this? Like the the plus one to mom's pregnancy <laughs> because now that's new. Second yeah. child, first pregnancy. Um, how did you handle that that experience? What was that like for you? So in the last episode, we spoke about how I felt very equal in the with Liam's journey um, when when Liam when I became Liam's dad. Um, this uh, this was totally different <laughs> um and i think i was uh i, I was t a bit taken aback by that I, I wasn't expecting to really be mm. the the just support b character in the story like just generally in life we don't consider ourselves as a supporting character in our own story um and and my first experience of of fatherhood was as an equal character now you're just the supporting character and it took me a little bit of time to process that. I mean, obviously, instinctively, you know that your wife is in a vulnerable physical and mental position. So you want to be supportive there. You're very aware of the fact that, you know, um, there's lots of pains and discomfort and a whole bunch of things that she needs support with. Um, obviously aware that she's carrying the bulk of the load this time. Um, yeah. And... And so there was a bit of time of processing that, um, of pushing myself as as this as the like joyful support of of my wife and and new ch new child on the way. Did you ever find yourself um, sort of recoiling into just 
watching and, and, and looking after Liam and really focusing your attention there, because there is a space where you felt exceptionally comfortable and you knew what your roles were and you knew that was sort of defined already. Um, in comparison to what Julie was now going through, where you were mm, second fiddle, I mm. suppose. Yeah, I would say, de oh, man, definitely. I, I probably at the time saw it as this is the best way I can provide support by taking away the, mm. as much care, childcare issues around for Liam as I could, which I and think makes was, sense, yeah. was, was, was a big part of it, but definitely the sense of, okay, this is where I'm, I'm comfortable here. This is what I know I can do. This is where I know my role is important. Um, yeah. You know, especially in those first few months of pregnancy, there's not really much you can do. <laughs> for your, you can make sure that, you know, she, her nutrition is, you know, you cook well for her if you can, you take, you know, physical loads away from her. Um, but other than that, it's all really on the pregnant mom to do what she yeah. needs to do. Um, yep. so, so definitely I felt a lot more aligned with caring for Liam than I did with caring for Eli, especially when he was still in utero. And, and fairly so. I mean, we often say on the podcast that we're happy to be the support role. There's, we, we know that's where we are supposed to be. Um, and it's also important then to ask dad, how is he processing being in that support role? So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, never all yeah. we want to take away from what mom's going through. Totally. We know she's going through the most. That's totally understandable. We're not saying, Hey, what about me? Yeah. Uh, but we are simply saying, make sure we check in with dad and, and see how is he processing this entire experience? And I think that's the, I think that was maybe a bit of a shock for me because again, with Liam, we're equals, I'm getting the same support i'm getting the same kind of questions hey how are you doing this is you know we're we're mm. getting conversations with we're both being spoken to by the social workers it's all equal this time that isn't really the case no one really asks asks me how i'm engaging with this the prospect of being a, a dad mm. to to us for the second time um you know, no one held a baby shower for me. I didn't have friends mm. telling me that I'm so strong and so, being so, you know, like you're doing so well. None of those things happened. Um, I think partly because we were in our group, in our like social circles, we were one of the first people to have kids. And right. the first people to have se a second child. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people who don't have kids don't quite know how to engage with the, they, they know from media and society how to engage with moms to be because, because we get, those stories get told all the time, but we don't really get told, okay, this is how you can support a dad until you've been a dad yourself. And then maybe you're a little bit more aware of it. Um, so because I didn't have other dad friends around me, there wasn't anyone pulling me inside and say, Hey, how's it, how's it going with you? Are you coping with these things? Um, which, which again, <laughs> would have been nice to have. Uh, I know you're the type of person that likes to, to think things through and to problem solve. So you mentioned a little earlier already, you know, hang on a second, we're going to have two in a pram and you can't push two separate prams. We need one pram, uh, to be able to move both kids around. Um, what was that again? I'm assuming that's a role that you very easily slipped into going, I can take care of these things. Let me think about that stuff. Um, and, and there's very little out there in terms of, uh, information on how to make these decisions well. <laughs> right yeah. you mm. you'd really have to research and just keep looking and keep looking and keep looking um did you find yourself making decisions that you wish you weren't left in charge of i, I must say in, in in all honesty when it came to those decisions and to those that kind of research and problem solving that was julie julie was the oh, really? uh, yeah so yeah i may i may have been worrying about the stuff but Julie okay. was the one who actually was the one who worried about it so much that she would do something about it something about it okay. um I very quickly adopted the role of cheer, of cheerleader, super enthusiastic. Okay. It, like whenever there's a moment of, are we going to be okay? Whenever there's a moment of anxiety around, are things going to be too difficult? Or what about, the, you know, we won't be able to handle this. My role was, no, we could do it. We've got this. It's going to be great. We'll find a solution. Let's work on it together. Like bringing in positive energy. That was, that was the role, um, which later on, through therapy, I realized that maybe that's not a role that I need to do all the time, but I don't think I was Are mature you? enough at the time to understand that. So literally, no matter what kind of day I would have at work, I would come home, 
take a deep breath at my front door, open up and be like, hey, everyone, how's it going? Are you good? Like bringing in good energy, good energy, good energy at, at, a, at quite a cost to my own mental health. Mm. Um, and the problem with that was is that Julie never asked that of me, right? So she's just assuming, well, Terrence is happy, he's enthusiastic, he's energized, He's bringing all this positive energy. I don't have to worry. Like, we don't have to worry about Terrence's mental health. We don't have to ask him how he's doing because he's showing zero signs that it's something that there's any struggle there whatsoever. And I mean, in that, in that situation, you have so much to think about and worry about. If it's, if the wheel isn't squeaky, it's not getting dealt with. Um, 100%. You know, so, so, and I at the time going, well, she's not asking me how I'm doing. She like, and no one's asking me how I'm doing people must just not care mm. but but really the reality is is that they're looking they're not they're not in my brain they're looking at the outside and going terrence is always smiling he's always good he's got a good energy and a good vibe about him he's all good so so there was a a real maturity that had to happen later well it would have been great to have been mature enough at the time to go hey i need a little bit of help here not as much help as julie does but some help and that's okay yeah so if we do rewind then a little bit back now and think about how uh, we found out that that Julie's pregnant and you have put on this um, facade how you were going to cheerlead your way through the pregnancy was the pregnancy an easy one for Julie was there a reason for you to be happy clappy the entire way <laughs> um it was it was fine up until about the seven and a half month mark when things started to um go awry we started to get some tests back that showed that julie might have preeclampsia and um I mean, she's spoken about this publicly so I, i'm assuming that she doesn't mind me talking about this here if you do sorry love um uh, but that was a process where in the course of a week we went from everything being fine to this baby has to come out of you today and i mean wow. that was that was something that i i even then even in those moments my my in my mind i still have to be that unflappable happy charming everything's all right good positive energy terrence um you know so so on the day where we get told hey your you know your wife could die your wife and your child mm. could die if we don't get mm -mm. this child out of you um i'm all smiles and hey cool let's do this all right woo you know um and no one I mean, I, and obviously Julie doesn't ask me. She, I think she may have asked me how, how I was doing. And I'm like, oh, good, that's fine. She doesn't probe any further because she's literally in a hospital bed about to give birth. So like that, yeah. is, not her, that is not her job in that moment. Her job is to be 100% focused no. on herself. Um, but, you know, no one pulls me aside to say, dude, take a breath. Like, this is a big day. This is a big deal. Mm. Don't, don't smile and say everything's fine. Everything's not fine. How are you doing? Are you are you okay? Can you take a breath here? Um, that didn't happen. And again, I don't really blame anyone else for that. It didn't happen because I put out a facade of, I am fine with this. Um, so so there was like this, you know, the sudden, your you know your child, you, you, this has to happen today. It was us trying to, you know, we wanted to do a natural birth, you know deciding between a c-section and a natural birth helping trying to help julie through that process of making the decision we had you know feeling burdened because i don't want to just leave the decision completely up to her but it is completely her decision to make so how do i support her in that it's a very confusing space for dad to be in you know because yeah yep. everyone has a right to make a decision about their own body but this is also yep. my child and this is this is my wife and you as my wife as, as the person who's about to go through this, you might not be in the 100% best mental state to make this decision. Uh, you know, going through those steps, going through that process was, was, a, was, was really intense. Um, eventually the decision was kind of made for us that we had to do the C-section. Um, and, and even in that moment, I mean, I, I think I, I mean, Judy says like, I cried. I don't remember crying. I don't remember necessarily feeling uh, anything but relief that this that everything had, had worked out. Uh, relief in a sense that worked out because 
she she lived to tell the tale or that the decision was made and that there was movement going forward so so firstly relief that we had made this decision and that it was okay. it was the safest option and then relief even more relief that it was over <laughs> um uh, and and almost other than relief quite a neutral feeling inside of you know there wasn't like there wasn't like this oh you know and i often speak about this there's a lot of dads who have this experience i wasn't like overwhelmed with love and adoration for this little child there were so many other things going on so many other balls to you know to juggle um you know family had arrived to like meet us after the operation uh julie's friend was there to take photos our doula was there obviously all of these things can't you know julie's in the bed and she's over completely overwhelmed um understandably so um obviously everyone wants to talk to mom and see baby um and I'm just kind of the guy who squirts hand sanitizer on people's hands as they walk into the room. Um, yeah. You know, again, no one, no one pulls, pulls dad aside to say, Hey, like, congratulations. How are you feeling? Uh, mm. Do you need any, like, yeah. And again, I, I had support. My, my, my family was there. I got people, you know, people were helping me with caring for Liam at the time who was at home while we were at night at the hospital. So, so there were people who were caring for me. But again, I, I had put out this facade that I'm like, I can deal with all of this. I'm fine. I'm all good. This is amazing. Yeah. Woo! That no one was able to, I had put up a wall that made it impossible for anyone to actually come in and really ask me the serious questions of like, what do you actually need right now? Um, mm. So there's really, there's really only in that time and looking back, there's no resentment for other people people because i'm so aware that if i had put my hand up and said i need something or i'm not okay that there would have been people there ready to help me but I, I just didn't know how to do that and i can i can well imagine that that space i think i'm not sure if you're reflecting um entirely or if at the time you knew there was something that you needed but didn't know how to articulate it i can say i wouldn't have known that i needed something and I wouldn't have known how to articulate it all combined. I would have just gone, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. And this is how I'm doing it. And this is, I wouldn't even think to, to visit those feelings or try and unpack those feelings a day, a month, a week later, I had no idea I was probably experiencing them. Um, and yeah. there isn't really, to my mind, someone that encourages dads to, to explore those feelings and unpack them because they're going to catch up with you eventually. <laughs> I yes. think we're both living proof of that. <laughs> yes. They're going to catch up with you eventually. Um, but uh, Eli is here. Julie is fine. Everything yep. is great. Right. Um, those, those, <laughs> those first few days after the birth, where was she? Where were you? What was that experience so, like? Yeah. So I went home uh, that night at around two o'clock in the morning um, mm. after Eli was born um, to relieve my mom who had been caring for Liam. Um, then the next morning I brought Liam to the hospital to meet his brother. Liam's nine. Well, well how, no, he's not nine months old. He's like 16, 17 months old. He's not impressed with this thing. He's like the hospital. Human. His, yeah. And his yeah. mom is in, his mom doesn't look very happy. So he, he's a bit overwhelmed. So it wasn't the hallmark moment that I was kind of hoping for. Um, that, mm -hmm. that happened later. Um, and so that for the next for the next week I, I I had leave so it was just me and Liam for the next two days at home um, until Julie came home um, and you know like we were talking about in the Zoe episode when you come home with your child from the hospital you have all of this care and all of the support um, uh, Eli was a bit jaundiced so we had to do the blue light thing at home as well um, okay. he was obviously a month he was a month prem I didn't actually mention that it was it was a month before he was due um, so he was quite tiny. Uh, so just him coming home, like on day three was a overwhelming and, and, and frightening experience in all honesty. Mm. But again, like we're saying, I didn't know that those emotions existed and that it was okay for you as a dad to experience those emotions. So, so, so when I get home, when we get home and my wife sits on the chair, actually, actually that chair that we're, that's behind me and she just starts crying because she's overwhelmed, the hormones are flowing through her, all that kind of stuff. I have no idea how to deal with that because I'm 
kind of experiencing that also at that exact time, but I don't even know that I'm experiencing that, so I can't relate to her experience. Um, and and so that was a bit of a, a mess uh, that first day back at home. It was just a mess of emotions of figuring out where everything goes, figuring out where how this new child fits into our life, um, making sure that Liam's okay, because again, we're so worried that he's going to feel like he's being replaced. You know, there's this child that's going to start looking like his mom and dad in a way that he never will. So we have to make sure that he feels completely validated. So like that was my role to like make sure that he gets all the attention and love that he deserves. Um, and we were, you know, we were in a small two bedroom flat and it was just, it was a lot. There was a lot going on. Again, a lot of support from friends and family. Um, but again, it was really focused on Judy and, and Eli. Yeah, it's not modeled to us any other way. Yeah. I can't think of any movie, any magazine, any family related experience where I've been let in that far to yeah. know that there is a range of emotions yes. that I'm going to go through. <laughs> yeah. And it just hasn't been modeled to me. It's not a conversation I've had with anybody ever before. So it's not surprising that we do feel, and again, talking about this now, so confused. Mm. Um, but suppressing all of those feelings because surely these aren't supposed to be things that I'm experiencing because you know, yeah. my role here is to be subservient to a certain extent. Um, so that that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, and, uh, and I guess I guess and, we, we do struggle with um, keeping two things in our heads at the same time. So you know, <laughs> we we are in that in that period we are supposed to be subservient, right? Like we are the support role. Like our job is to make sure that mom and child get whatever they need to thrive in those moments that's the that's the dad's yeah. role but at the yeah. same time it's also equally true that you are more than just that role you are also yeah. a person who has gone through uh amazing and terrifying change in your life and that you need support through that too you are not a robot you're not an automaton um but i think because we struggle to hold both of those things in our minds we we completely go into robot we become robot butlers, right? We have no yeah. emotion about the thing. <laughs> we are just there to serve. And, and I don't think, I think, I think the fathers aren't able to show that they need and deserve care. And I think we do not know how to show care for fathers. So I think it's a double whammy of, mm. we don't know, we don't, dads can't put up their hand. They don't know how to put up their hand and say, Hey, I need care. And even if the dad was able to say that we are like, what is, what does care for a dad even look like? Mom's right yeah. there. Mom and child. Yeah, child don't be so bored. selfish, dad. Don't be so selfish, yeah. dad. I mean, even like I, I, as we're talking about this process, like what would I have needed in that moment? I don't even know. And that mm. is a sad thing. I, that, that seven years later, seven and a half years later, I still don't know what Terrence of, of that time really would have appreciated or, or not even appreciated what he needed because I don't think he would have even appreciated the thing. But what would I be able to look back on now and go, I'm so glad this happened or this person said this thing or this person did, did that thing because it helped me yeah. grow as a dad in that moment. I, I don't know what that is. We're now thinking back on that experience going, if someone had brought me a cup of hot chocolate, it would have made things better. But in actual fact, what we needed was someone to probe us asking us, are you okay? Three times in a row for yeah. us to actually deal with what we were feeling because we didn't need anything physical. We didn't need to be waited on. We didn't need, we didn't need any of that stuff. Yeah. That, I'm yeah. not, I don't want you to bring me my shoes. I don't want to lie under a blanket. I don't want any of that. But if someone had really pushed and, in, and encouraged me to speak through the feelings, which I'm never comfortable doing, yes, unless yeah, it's yeah. with you. Yeah, but no, but you unless need to be pushed. Unless it's here and with you. But, even with but you Zo need to be pushed in that direction. But yeah. even with our conversation with you and Zoe, like you are a progressive, open-minded and open-souled person. But even with the conversation with you, I had to really pr like push you like, okay, great. But what were you feeling, Sean? Like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what we're yeah. both, that's what I think what we're, we're all like. Um, I, I think for me, looking back and, and now also just spitballing um, off of what you just said, I think I would have also needed to hear stories of how other dads felt. Mm. And, and this is always what Aphrodite has been trying to do because of my experience. This is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Is hopefully that there's a dad out there 
who's going through something similar to what we went through or dads went through going through something similar to, to what we've gone through and to be able to go oh wait those guys felt those things uh do i feel the same thing just a comparison to go do i feel do i now that i've heard how to talk about it yeah and to think about it okay yes, I do feel these three things, but I don't feel that. And I do feel this. And this is how I'm going to engage with that. I, I didn't have any of those stories. I didn't have other mm -hmm. men talking in the way that we're hopefully talking now about these things. And, and looking back, that would have been so great to go, oh, this older father whose kid is now eight, nine years old, I've heard him talk about fatherhood and about his first experience. And I can relate to what his experience was and that would have been really helpful for me to 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 process that time a bit better i think when it comes to eli's life uh, he's been around now for seven years mm. is that right seven yes it's got pushing eight in july six okay seven. so um i need seven words for you please seven words from the last seven years seven and they don't words. have to make a sentence oh thank goodness um loud he's a very loud kid Determined, creative, cut, uh, this is going to sound weird after all the other ones, cuddly, because he is, he does, he is a bit of a cuddle monster. What about your experience over the last seven Ooh. years? Oh, okay. So the last will be about my experience. The last time. Okay. Um, challenging yeah. and um, growth. So all of these things, Eli's one of those kids and... Um, I, I try not to speak too glowingly about my kids publicly because it's kind of annoying parents. But but Eli's the kid that every time you think he's not going to be able to do something because he's scared to do it or he hasn't been able to do it previously, when he decides to do it, he just goes and does it. He's wow. he just every single time. So I'm not. I used to be so worried about him, like oh man, he's so nervous, he's so scared about stuff. He's he's got his dad's anxieties, and then he just goes and like oh he's riding his bike. He, he didn't want to ride it yesterday. He was scared to ride it yesterday, but today he's just like, I'm going to do it today. So, mm. um, so we've just seen this tremendous growth in him over the last few years where he's, um, he's just taken things in his stride. And, but again, just like he decided he had to arrive early, uh, he, yes. just, he wasn't going to go the full nine months. He wanted to arrive early. Everything about it. That's where I, that's why I used determined like, Eli will do things the way Eli does things in his own time and it'll be okay. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for listening or watching this episode of Have You Asked Your Dad? We would love to know what your experience was like when you first became a parent, not just the good stuff, but also the hard things. And I think it's great when we share those stories, we really encourage each other more. I feel encouraged. I hope you feel encouraged as well. Please send that through to our email address, hyaydpod at gmail.com. That's hyatpod at gmail.com. Or get us on Instagram. Just search for Have You Asked Your Dad. But until next week, Sean and I will catch you soon. Cheers for now.